Most speakers radiate sound from the front. Apparently that seems to work the best, or does it? Then why are there speakers that also radiate from the front and the back and even speakers that radiate in all directions equally? Let me start with a clear statement. Whatever you choose, there will be no best way. There might be a best way for you and your listening environment, at least to your judgement, and the same goes for me. There is no way we can reproduce the exact acoustic situation from the concert hall in your listening room. That would even be highly undesirable in most cases given the loudness levels. What you can achieve is have your brain believe it is experiencing the live event. To do this, Alan Blumlein developed his binaural sound system in the 30s of the previous century. This system is now known as stereo and uses two channels of audio that contain spatial information in the form of spectral, loudness and time clues. An instrument on the right side of the orchestra will sound less loud, less bright and slightly delayed in the left speaker than in the right speaker, and so on. It is this kind of information that makes our brain believe there is a hole between and behind the speakers. Now how does this work? I will try to keep this comprehensible and thus simplify things somewhat. Let's see what happens in a live environment. An orchestra in a concert hall. When the orchestra starts playing, the sound will not only travel directly to your ears, but also via reflections on the walls and ceiling. The direct sound reaches your ears the earliest since it had to travel the shortest distance. Then there is a group of reflections that took the shortest way via walls and ceiling. These are called early reflections and by definition take 30 milliseconds or less to reach your ears. After that, the sound that has been bouncing through the hall will reach you. This is called reverberation and is more dense than the early reflections but lower in level and more coloured by the losses in the air and the texture of the boundaries. The spacing of reflections and the spectral balance of it will influence how we experience the hall. Sound travels at about 334 meters per second, so the latest early reflections at 30 milliseconds have travelled about 11 meters more than the direct sound. I don't know how big your house is, but in my room that would be rather impossible. A clear proof that a concert hall differs greatly from a living room and that trying to reproduce the exact physics of a concert hall in the living room is far from realistic. And unnecessary either. Our hearing, or rather our auditory system, distills a lot of information from temporal clues in the sound. It triggers on flanks of the sound wave and integrates the first 5 milliseconds to determine localization and tonal balance. It is therefore of eminent importance to prevent early reflections in your listening room that follow the direct sound at only 5 milliseconds or less. Sound travels about 1.7 meters in 5 milliseconds and it's easy to determine the time difference between the direct sound and the first reflection using a string as I have described in my loudspeaker placement video. The link is in the show notes. Acousticians often prefer to have a greater difference in arrival time between the direct sound and the first reflection, at least 10 milliseconds, preferably the double or more. But it's not only time that's of importance. The level and the spectral balance is too. The louder the reflected sound, the more critical the time difference becomes to the direct sound and the same goes for the brightness of the sound. And now we get to the subject of this video. Most speaker systems only have drivers on the front and therefore will radiate sound forwards for as long as the sound waves are effectively blocked to go backwards. This only goes for mid and high frequencies. Low frequencies radiate omni omnidirectional, so in all directions. 
They simply fold around the cabinet. The idea behind omnidirectional speakers is that since the lows are omnidirectional, you better make the mids and highs omnidirectional as well so that the sound towards the walls has the same spectral balance as the direct sound. Conventional unidirectional speakers not only block mids and highs backwards, but also have a frequency dependent dispersion towards the front. Where a mid-range speaker can have a 60 degree dispersion at 500 Hz, it might narrow to, say, 15 degrees at 2000 Hz. The tweeter then takes over having a wider dispersion again. Therefore the off-axis response of a normal speaker is always colored to some degree. This gave some developers at the end of the 60s the idea to have a speaker radiate the same frequency spectrum towards the walls and the front. In the book Music, Acoustics and Architecture, Dr. Leo Baranek wrote that in a concert hall the sound that reaches the ears of the concert goer is predominantly reflected sound and that therefore loudspeakers should radi radiate in all directions equally. There seemed to have been a wide interest in this in and around Boston at that time. A respected name then was Roy Allison who passed away only last year. He was an audio journalist up to 1959 when he started working for loudspeaker manufacturer Acoustic Research. He there was involved in developing the much appreciated AR speakers like the AR3A and, important in this perspective, the AR LST. He left in 1972 and researched the interaction between the loudspeaker and the room and published about it. He then founded Allison Acoustics Inc. and made the well respected Allison One loudspeaker. The LST and One were not only directional, they needed to be placed against the wall to avoid reflections from the wall, but the angled mounting of the mid and high speaker units made a wide dispersion possible towards the side walls. Another well known name from that era is Dr. Amar Bose that studied psychoacoustics and electrical engineering and was convinced that when sound was radiated mainly towards the walls it would sound far more natural. So he developed a speaker that only radiated 11% of the sound towards the listener and 89% towards the rear wall. He used nine identical wideband speakers and used an equalizer to force them to a wide frequency response. Therefore a powerful amp was needed, but then the sound was impressive and emerging, although not super precise. Around that time there also was a Scandinavian manufacturer that built a speaker that had several mid-range speakers and tweeters mounted on top of the cabinet in a way that the sound was spread in all directions. Other brands that made Omnis were Harman Kardon, Hegemann, Morrison Audio, Tenoy and even Akai. The idea never led to great popularity, but still a number of brands manufactured them. Mirage, MLB, Duval, Temporal Coherence and others. Most of these use a deflector for each driver to spread the audio in all directions. A variant on this is the bipolar speaker. This type of speaker has drivers on two sides playing in phase. It adheres to the same ideal as the Omni but with a simpler construction. The number of manufacturers and models is limited unless you want surround speakers. Where I use the Mirage omnidirectional speakers for surround, many use bipolar speakers, more or less constructed like the Ellison One, only smaller. The idea is that you don't need pinpoint precision but an ambient sound field for the surround. The front speakers play the main part where placement is concerned. Where the omnidirectional and bipolar speakers had their radiation pattern as a design goal, bipolar speakers have their radiation pattern as a result of the technique used. For the dipolar speakers I know use large membranes that radiate on two sides, the electrostatic speaker and the magnetostatic speaker. Both use a thin sheet of plastic, often mylar, that is moved by either electrostatic or magnetic force. When that membrane moves forward, 
a positive pressure is caused in front of the speaker, while at the same time at the rear there is an equally strong negative pressure. In other words, front and rear are out of phase, resulting in no output on the sides since there front and rear pressures cancel out each other. This is an interesting technique since it causes the same audio spectrum and pressure to the front and the rear, making the tonal balance of the reflected sound only dependent of the wall material. But where omnidirectional speakers also radiate the same sound to the side walls, where most early reflections will come from, the dipole speaker does not radiate to the sides so that when those sides are aimed more or less at the point of first reflection, early reflections can be controlled effectively. Using omnidirectional or bipolar speakers in an average sized room will create lots of early reflections very close after the direct sound. This makes localization quite difficult, but if you have the space to place the speakers some meters from the wall, it can lead to very spacious and powerful sound image. Getting the pinpoint location many audiophiles search for will remain more difficult with this type of speaker. Dipole speakers provide a lot of the benefits of omnidirectional speakers and can offer good sound localization due to the dead sides. They still need 2 meters distance from the wall they are in front of, but the distance to the side walls is less critical. Both electrostatic and magnetostatic speakers aren't the cheapest and do need an amplifier that can drive them properly. Loudspeaker placement is of great influence to the sound with any speaker, but even more so with omnis and bipolar speakers. Dipolar speakers might be a fair way in between if you can, get, can live with the size and the price of the large panel speakers. The luscious, spacious sound all three types can generate does have its share of fans, but those searching for strongly focused instruments with pinpoint precision should not look here. Again, it is a matter of preference and priorities. I have played with electrostatic speakers by Quad, Van Medevoort and Martin Logan for years. Currently I use conventional speakers by Audiophysics for in the end I chose for the precision. Although in the end sounds too definitive. If I find a speaker that pleases me more, that has a different approach and fits my budget at that time, I might switch again. And I sure let you know. So if you want to stay informed, subscribe to this channel or follow me on Twitter, Facebook or Google+. See the show notes for the links. If you have a question, post it below this video, but please don't ask me for buying advice. See my About Questions video to find out why. If you like this video, please consider supporting the channel through Patreon and see super exclusive videos too. Just one dollar a month will do. The link is in the show notes. Don't forget to tell your friends on the web about this channel. I am Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on the HBproject.com. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.